Well, I'm going to begin today with a little quiz. It's been a while since we've done that, so I'm going to start with a little bit of fun. Uh, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you um, a quote or a little snippet uh, from American literature, American history, and I want you to be able to tell me back just out loud who it was who said that or wrote that, okay? You don't look very enthusiastic. There are two points for every correct answer. Some of them will have bonus points. That's one point per bonus. I think there are 15 total points you can get in this quiz. So keep track of your own score because there will be prizes. Okay? (laughs) Ready? First. Here's the first quote. Four score and seven years ago. You all get two points. Okay? Abraham Lincoln. uh, That was the Gettysburg Address. Bonus question. One point. In what year did he give the Gettysburg Address? No points for you. 1863. Somebody said 1876. He died in 1865. That would have been difficult. 1863. So if you got that, you get one extra point, so you have three points total. Okay, did you know the entire Gettysburg Address was only 271 words? About a page and a half of typed text. Incredible. Second question. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. FDR. Two points for everybody who said that. Okay. Bonus question. In what year did he say that? Everybody said 41. Not true. He actually gave, said this in his first inaugural address in 1933. Okay. No points for any of you. Two points. Okay. Third. Ask not what your country can do for you. JFK. Okay, I'm not even going to give any bonus points. It was 1961, his inaugural address. Next question, fourth question. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Neil Armstrong, astronaut, 1969. No, that's not the bonus question. You get no points for that. Everybody knows that. (laughs) Bonus question, what was the number of the Apollo mission? Eleven. Bonus points for you, Bill. You finally got one. Good. Double bonus, double bonus, what were the names of the other two astronauts with him on Apollo 11? People are going, Buzz, Buzz Lightyear? Oh, Buzz who? Buzz? <laughs> Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins, of course. Michael Collins, Buzz Aldrin, Michael How would you like to be those guys? Everybody remembers Neil Armstrong. Nobody knows who those other two guys were. Okay, one last question. Last one, most important one. See, now you're enthusiastic. That's good. Yo, Adrian! Rocky Balboa. Bonus question, in what year did the first movie, Rocky, come out? 1975. Holy smokes. We are all dinosaurs. Okay. Ancient. Okay, there were 15 total points. Anybody get all 15 total points? Be honest. Who thinks they had the most points? You got them in your head. How many? Okay, I just I'm going to be magnanimous. You all get a prize, free donut holes. Other than the today, we continue our series that comes from one of the greatest pieces of literature in human history. Our series is called "Built to Last." Comes from the great New Testament letter to the Ephesians, writ- written almost two thousand years ago by a man who never saw a computer, never saw an automobile, and never had a cell phone. Yet a man whose intellect just leaps off the page for us, a man who, whose words under the guidance of the Holy Spirit have changed hearts and indeed changed the world for 20 centuries. Now remember, the Apostle Paul, who's writing, is writing in about the year 61 or 62 A.D. So this is less than 30 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. Now, just to put that in perspective, uh, how many of you can remember when the Bears won the Super Bowl? Okay? That was more than 30 years ago. So, in perspective, there are people still living at the writing of this letter who remember the events around the death and resurrection of Jesus. That's some really interesting perspective. So, Paul is in Rome. He's under a kind of house arrest awaiting trial before Caesar. Talk about that in a little bit. Ephesus, as Jeff outlined for you last week, was a very cosmopolitan, affluent city. 
a very worldly city. In many ways, a very, in many ways, a very unlikely place for the gospel of Jesus Christ to take hold, a very unlikely place for the church to be established, and yet it was. In fact, the Ephesian church became one of the stronger and more influential churches in the ancient world at that time. A brief summary of this letter, the first half of the letter, the first three chapters or so, are kind of a, a primer, a theology of the gospel. What Jesus came to do, what he did for each one of us, and who we are as believers in him. And then the last half of his letter is about practical living as followers of Jesus in the world. Now, it's crucial for us to see uh, that Paul uh, organized his letter, his thoughts, on purpose in that order. Because it's crucial to know that who we are in Christ shapes and informs how we are to live in the world, not the other way around. Because that's the power of the gospel. Now, last week, Paul started off by teaching us that we are chosen by the Father, we are redeemed or paid for, bought back by the Son, and that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Now today we pick up chapter 1 and verse 15. Let me read these verses to you. I'm going to read them straight through, and then we're going to uh, unpack them together. So Ephesians 1, beginning in verse 15. For this reason... Because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Now notice that. Paul is proceeding to take a, he's proceeding to tell these Ephesians about his prayers for them. This is, in a sense, a prayer for the Ephesians and, in God's way, a prayer for us. Remembering you in my prayers that, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward, those, toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated them at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. <laughs> that was like one sentence, okay? Those are all just commas. Those aren't periods. Words are just tumbling out of Paul's mind and heart. Verse 22, And he put all things under his feet, and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So notice, first, like I pointed out, this is, Paul's prayer for the Ephesians and for the churches of, of Asia Minor, that part of the world, and his prayer for us. Paul is sharing uh, what his deepest thoughts are for them. He thanks God for their faith, and then he prays that God the Father would give them four spiritual realities. Four things. First, that he would give them the spirit of wisdom, he says. The spirit of wisdom. Some time ago, uh, a woman who was very new to our church, very new to her faith, uh, came to see me at my office, which is right on this floor, right down where the fireplace is now in, that, in those days. Uh, as soon as she walked into my office, she began to weep. She sat down, she kept weeping, and she couldn't gather herself. And then when, the first thing she said to me was, what's happening to me? And I was like, uh, what do you mean? And she said, I handed her my Kleenex box, which I always keep near my office, and she said, well, every time I come into this building, again, she was very new to her faith, er especially when I walk into the sanctuary where you're sitting right now, she said, I start to do this. I start to weep, but I'm not sad. Can you tell me what's happening to me? And I knew just a little bit of her story uh, that from the previous week. And so I said to her, uh, I don't want to scare you or to freak you out in any way, but I think I know what's happening to me. I think that's the Holy Spirit of God that was promised to you by faith that's filling your heart with the awareness of the love and presence of Jesus as God. That's why you're weeping, but you're not sad. See, when we put our faith in Christ, the Bible tells us we receive three gifts simultaneously, and they're promised. First, the gift of salvation, 
That's the gift of eternal life. Second, the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is the presence of Christ in spiritual form who dwells in the place of our being called the heart. We'll talk about that in just a moment. And thirdly, spiritual gifts, which are given to us, intended for the service of others in and through the the ministry of the church. We'll talk about that later in this whole series. Last week, Paul introduced the Holy Spirit to us by saying, the Spirit is like a seal on our hearts. A seal in the ancient world served as kind of a legal signature, which guaranteed ownership of something that had been purchased, like a contract. So, Paul is saying, through the Holy Spirit, God says, I have chosen you, I have adopted you, I have redeemed you, you are mine. The Holy Spirit is his seal. Now we add something else to the Ephesians' understanding of the Holy Spirit and to ours. The role of the Holy Spirit, he says, verse 15, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you, here's what he wants them to have, the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. So the Holy Spirit not only seals our salvation, he gives us wisdom, revelation, and enables us to know Jesus in a personal way. Now, there's a couple of really interesting words here. Let me try to break them down for you. He says, the spirit of wisdom. The Greek word for wisdom is sophia, means insight or intelligence. It's the root of our English word philosophy or sophistication. And see, the ancient world was filled with many different wisdom philosophies. Philosophies of great thinkers, philosophies about the world, philosophies about truth. Just as our world today is filled with many, many philosophies, lots and lots of intelligent people tell us different things about what is true. But this isn't just any wisdom, Paul is saying. This is wisdom anchored in the truth of God. Because Paul says, the spirit of wisdom and of revelation Now, this word revelation is the Greek word apocalypsis, which is the same word that's in the title of the very last book of our Bible, which is called the Revelation, the Apocalypses of Jesus Christ. It means the unveiling of truth, the revealing of truth. See, we don't create truth. See, our culture tells us you can create your own truth. That's the gospel of our world. But that's not true. The Bible says truth is revealed to us. It's given to us through God's word and through the revelation of Jesus Christ. In this case, it's the truth of Christ. So the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Then he says, in the knowledge of him. In the knowledge of him. Now, Paul had several choices for the word knowledge. The the word he chose for knowledge here is a word that does not refer to abstract philosophical knowledge. It refers to a kind of personal knowledge. Knowledge gained from first-hand experience. In other words, not book knowledge, but personal relationship. Last night we had um, our biannual couples event out at the Kessinger campus. Some of you, many of you may have been there. We had 750 or more husbands and wives. And the purpose of that event was not to learn more about the philosophy of marriage. The purpose of that event was to grow in our knowledge of each other. See, I can't get to know my wife better by reading about her in a book. I might learn some things about her, but I wouldn't get to know her. I get to know her through personal relationships. That's the word Paul uses for knowledge of him. Paul calls this having the eyes of your heart enlightened. See, for Paul, the heart was the center of our beings, the emotional, motivational, and relational center of our lives. And that's where he says the Holy Spirit lives. That's where he reveals Christ to us. That's where he teaches Christ to us. That's where we build our relationship with Christ. See, what we have here, what he's teaching us is not a philosophy. Our faith is not a religion. 
There are lots of philosophies. There are lots of religions. Our faith is a relationship with a God who has been revealed to us through Jesus Christ. That's what he, Jesus taught his disciples in John chapter 14. When we read, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that's the Holy Spirit, to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, watch, for he dwells with you and will be in you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all I have said to you. So Paul is saying, I pray, dear Ephesians, I pray that you will grow in your knowledge, in your relationship with God, who has, been re- who has revealed himself to you most fully in Jesus Christ, and through his Holy Spirit dwells in your hearts by faith. That's the first thing he wants them to have, the spirit of wisdom. Secondly, he prays that they would know their glorious hope. That they would know their glorious hope. Uh, Some time ago, I came across a t-shirt. I don't remember if it was um, in a truck stop somewhere or somewhere, but I saw a t-shirt. And I don't know if you can exactly read that, but here's what the t-shirt said on it. It said, live your life so the preacher won't have to lie at your funeral. I really wish I'd purchased that T-shirt. See, as a pastor, of course, I have participated in my share of funerals and memorial services. It's just one of the things you do uh, in the role of pastor, and it's, it's a precious thing to do. And I've learned over the years that while all funerals, all memorial services are the same in that they involve grief and loss, not all funerals and memorial services are exactly the same. Because in some, and some of you will know exactly what I'm talking about, in some of those, there is a pervasive and powerful sense of of hope and joy, even joy, that in the midst of the grief and the loss, it sort of fills and permeates the room. You can feel it. But in others, there is a kind of coldness and emptiness, a kind of despair. And I've come to believe that the difference between those two experiences has to do with the person who's gone, with the person who's not even there anymore. Because what happens, I believe, is that when the person being remembered lived a life of faith and hope in Christ that was guaranteed to them by the Holy Spirit that sealed their self, and when that is true, That hope rushes into the room and fills the room with that sense. And you can feel it when you're in the room. But when the person being remembered did not have that faith, did not live in that hope, or at least people aren't sure, then the room is just that much emptier. And what happens is, and this is kind of a harsh thing to say, but what happens is, in those cases, people pretend. They pretend that there was faith. They pretend that there's hope. And there's a difference. Paul says that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? Now, what is that hope? Remember last week, we we learned that in Christ, we have been chosen from before the foundation of the earth. We've been adopted as his children. In Christ, we receive a new identity, and with that new identity comes the promise of an inheritance. We've been adopted into an inheritance that is now ours. Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 1, describes that inheritance this way. He says, and notice the words I've put in red here, so you know that Peter and Paul are talking about the same experience. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth, new identity, into a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance, there's that same word, that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance inheritance is kept in heaven for you. Now, usually we sort of shorten all this down to simply heaven, the hope of heaven. Now, we could do several months' worth of sermons about the hope of heaven, and we have, I've done series like this in the past, we'll do them in the future again. But, The riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints is how Paul talks about it. 
It's what the Bible calls a new heaven and new earth. God's promise that Jesus will one day redeem all things. He will redeem us, give us new spiritual bodies. He will redeem the whole earth itself. He will destroy his enemies. Even death itself will be finally destroyed. And we will live and worship and celebrate for all eternity in his presence. We will feast at his banquet table. We will serve at his bidding. We will reign with him, the Bible says. Paul himself says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. The glorious hope. Now, we also know that in our culture, almost everybody simply assumes they're going to be in heaven someday, right? That's our cultural assumption. I actually overheard a conversation, I might have mentioned this uh, to you a few months ago, but I overheard a conversation in a coffee shop, I was just sitting working on some stuff, having my my mocha flavored coffee, and I wasn't trying to overhear, but there was two young guys talking, I just couldn't help it, the tables were really close together, and one guy said to the other, 20 something guys, one guy said, I don't know if there's a God or not, but I'm pretty sure I'll go to heaven. You've got to think about that one a little bit. I'm not sure about the whole God thing, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to be in heaven, okay? I was thinking, hmm. See, that young man is a product of the philosophy of our culture. I saw a survey once that showed more Americans believe they will be in heaven than actually believe there is a heaven. And that Jesus is the way to get there. Paul says that heaven is the glorious inheritance of the saints. It's the glorious inheritance, not of everyone, not of all philosophies, not of really, really good people. It's the inheritance of the saints, he says. And by saints, he means those who have put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Revealed truth. Chosen, redeemed, and sealed. He prays they would have that glorious hope. Thirdly. He prays that they would know God's immeasurable power. That you would know his immeasurable power. A week before last, one of my boys and I took a quick two-day trip to the Grand Canyon. As our boys were growing up, uh, I would plan a series of special events, just me and them, uh, to celebrate certain milestones of their developing lives at 10, at age 13, at age 18, and at age 21. So this was a chance for my third son, Micah, and I to make a trip. I asked him what he wanted to do back in the fall. He said, well, I've always wanted to go to the Grand Canyon. Okay? We found a trip. We did a trip to the Grand Canyon last week. So this is him sitting on the south rim of the Grand Canyon. How many of you have been to the Grand Canyon? A few minutes. Okay. Then you, you recognize this photo. Now, this is me. I, I had a little... A little difficulty on one of the ledges. But those of you who have been there will understand this illustration. When we saw it, I mean, we've seen pictures. Both of us have seen pictures, but we've never been there. And when we saw it for the first time, we just were struck silent. We, we just stood there and stared, like dumbstruck. When my fun, son finally could speak, this is what he said. He said, it's what I thought it would be, only bigger and better, he said. The Grand Canyon is absolutely overwhelming in size, scope, and beauty. It's, you can't wrap your mind around the power it took to carve that out of rock. The last morning we were there, the second day in the morning, we decided to get up early. I uh, got up at 6 a.m., which in Arizona time it was still completely dark, just pitch dark. We wanted to go see the sunrise over the Grand Canyon. So we had to leave our lodge and walk about a mile through the absolute darkness, could only see the stars uh, to get to the canyon. Couldn't see anything, just the step in front of us. So while we were still several hundred yards away from the rim, I I could hear something. And we're walking, I said to my son, can you hear that? And he said, yeah, what is that? We're listening, it it sounded like like the ocean in the distance. We're in Arizona, it sounded like 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 an ocean, like you hear at 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 the beach. 
And it, with each step, it got a little louder. It got a little louder. And then it was not an ocean at the beach. It was kind of a, it became a, more of a, a roar, a rushing sound, like the roar of a passing train. And then we realized it was the wind rolling through the canyon. We could hear the Grand Canyon way before we could see it. It was like the canyon was, was speaking to us, shouting to us, and I couldn't help but think of the great Old Testament word in Hebrew, ruach. Ruach, which means wind, breath, spirit. This is the same word used in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2 in the creation account when the Bible says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. That word for spirit is ruah. The wind of God, the breath of God, was hovering over the darkness. Power of God. Ephesians says, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward those who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated them at his right hand in the heavenly places. The immeasurable greatness of his power. I think Paul here is thinking about his own story. Many of you know the basic outline of Paul's story. He was once Saul of Tarsus, a proud and arrogant man, a man who used his religious knowledge, his religious position to arrest and persecute and harass and, if need be, kill followers of Jesus of Nazareth. When he was on his way to Damascus to do just that, he's confronted by Christ himself and a blinding light from heaven, and in that moment, God chose Saul, transformed him, rebirthed him, Saul turned upside down, turned inside out, turned around, and became Paul the apostle of the gospel to the Gentiles. Now what kind of power turns Saul of Tarsus into Paul the apostle? That's what he calls the immeasurable power of God. The God who created the universe with the breath of his mouth, who carved the Grand Canyon, raised Jesus from the dead. And that Spirit of God breathes life into that which is spiritually dead. So Paul wants the Ephesians to know, and he wants us to know, that that same immeasurable power resides in us by the gift of the Holy Spirit, the breath of God. Fourth, Paul prays that they would know Christ above all. Christ above all. Ephesians 1, verse 21. Far above all all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he has put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. This is classic Paul. Just words uh, tumbling out of a heart so full and a mind so filled with the supremacy and beauty of Christ that he can't stop himself. The words just keep tumbling out. Notice the language. Christ is above all rule and authority and power and dominion. Now the word dominion here is interesting. It means lordship. So what's Paul telling us here? Think for a moment about where Paul is when he's writing this. Paul is under a kind of house arrest in Rome, awaiting trial before Caesar. Okay, that's, that's what he's doing. And at that time in the world, Caesar, which was just the title of the emperor of Rome, Caesar would have been the emperor Nero. You've probably heard that name. Nero. Nero Claudius Caesar, a man so powerful, he regarded himself as a god, even when he became emperor at age 17. A man known for such debauchery and violence, he had his own mother executed, and she was the one that got him into the role, because he was jealous. A man who took pleasure in throwing Christians to wild dogs for his own entertainment. A man known to light his gardens by burning Christians alive. This is the Caesar called Nero. Historians believe this is the same man who eventually, just about four or five years later, would have Paul himself executed by beheading in about 66 A.D. So when Paul uses words like rule and power and dominion, I think he's thinking about 
And yet, notice, in this letter, there is no hint whatsoever of fear of the emperor Nero. He doesn't ask the Ephesians for help. He doesn't ask them to pray for him because he could be executed by this crazy dictator. He's not asking them to send food. He's not begging for safety. Nothing. He just says Christ is far above all rule, all authority, all power and dominion and above every name that is named. Paul has no fear of Nero because Christ is greater than Nero. He has no fear of death because Christ is greater than death. Because to Paul, Christ is above all. And now think about who he's writing to. He's writing to the Ephesians. People who live in the city known, famous, for the great temple of Artemis. This is an artist's rendition of what the temple would have looked like in its heyday. Bigger than a football field, made entirely of marble, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Home of worship to a pagan fertility goddess. Acts chapter 19 tells us that when Paul confronted worshipers of Artemis, they tried to shout him down by shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Today, all that's left of that temple is this one lone pillar. So when Paul says Christ is above every name that is named, I think there's a good chance he's thinking about the name that those people shouted to him that day. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Uh Uh-uh. He's saying Jesus is not just greater than, but far above all those names. Remember, the pagan gods and goddesses of the time were very demanding. People believed they were very demanding of human beings. They didn't do things for human beings. They demanded obedience. They demanded sacrifices. And if you didn't give them what they wanted, they punished you ruthlessly. He's saying Christ is not like that. He's above all, but he does things for you. He sacrificed himself for you. He gives you new identity. He gives you a new destiny forever. See, Paul is hammering away at the supremacy of Christ because the gospel is not about what we do for God to get favors from him. The gospel is about what God has done for us. And he hammers away at it. Years ago, maybe 15 years ago or so now, some of you will remember this story. Uh, a woman in our church who doesn't uh, live around here anymore came to me and asked me if I would c- visit her mother, uh, who was homebound. And I said, well, sure, I'll visit your mother. What's the situation? She said, well, my mom's dying. And if you go to see her, you need to know that she doesn't go to church, she doesn't believe in God, and she's not a very nice person. Okay, okay, okay. Um, I said, well, I will go, but are you sure she'd, she'd let me come visit her? She said, well, yeah, I know, because I asked her. Because the one time she did come to church with our family, she said, she came to a, one of your Christ- our Christmas Eve services just to watch the granddaughter play in the bell choir. And afterwards, she said, we asked her what she thought. She said, oh, I, I, I like the young man up there who was talking about me. It was a long time ago. So, so we arranged uh, for me to drop by her mom's house one day that week. I went by. I was a little nervous. Uh, her name was Charlotte. She was 77 years old, um, and she had lived a very hard and painful life. The first day, I just listened to her, told some of her story. Um, she had uh, been widowed earlier in her life, had lived with cancer on and off for about 10 years, been in treatment, and she was a pretty tough character. She was bitter and angry about almost everything, and she used um, salty language to express that. I mean, she would swear right to me like it was nothing, Okay. But she also seemed kind of glad I was, I'd come, and she offered to pray for her at the end of uh, an hour or so. She let me pray, which I thought was good. And then I asked if I could come back sometime. She said, yes, I could. So that began what would eventually become kind of a six-month relationship, me and Charlotte. On the second or third visit I was there, I noticed a stack of books on her coffee table, about six high. Every book was about heaven in some way. Her daughter had been bringing her books, hoping she would read. And she didn't go to church her whole life. She knew nothing about it and didn't want to know anything about God. She was angry. So I looked, I said, Charlotte, uh, I noticed the books are there. Uh, have you read any of those? She goes, oh, I read all of them. Some of them more than once. And then I had a brilliant idea. I said, since you're reading books about heaven, maybe one of the things we can talk about when I'm here is how to be sure, how to know that you're going to be in heaven someday. No. Brilliant idea, right? All the books are right there. She said, oh, I'd like that. So we started talking about Jesus. She knew nothing from nothing. She didn't know anything about the Bible. She didn't know the story of the gospel. 
but she let me talk to her about it. And so over the next few visits, that's what we talked about. But eventually, when I thought she just might be ready at home one day, I, 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 I typed out a prayer on my computer. I called it Charlotte's Prayer, just a simple prayer of faith, salvation. I took it with me next time I went to see her. As I got there, I just said, Charlotte, I did something, and you don't have to do this, but I wrote out a prayer that I think I just want you to see if you understand it. So I gave her the paper, and we read it together. I said, now, do you understand? She said, yeah, I understand the prayer. I said, and if you are ready and you want to, I can pray that prayer with you today. And she looked straight at me and said, yeah, I'm ready to do that. So there that afternoon, we prayed that simple prayer together. And I believe Paul's telling us that at that moment, that afternoon, somewhere in Batavia, in her home, God sealed her salvation. Now, Charlotte didn't have but a few weeks to live. She didn't have very long to understand the lavishness of God's grace. She didn't have a very long time to learn and to grow. She stayed a pretty tough lady. But the Bible tells us the promise was sealed that God knew her from the beginning of the world, that he had chosen her and wanted desperately to adopt her and wanted her to know the hope of her glorious inheritance. That's what Paul's telling us. And all of that happened that afternoon. Charlotte died just a couple of weeks after that. But I think today, no today, she knows her eternal That's what Paul prayed for the Ephesians 2,000 years ago. That's what he prayed prayed in a sense for us all these years later. And above all else, that's what we are to pray for ourselves and for those that we know in our lives. We can pray for things. We can pray for help. We can pray for all kinds of things. But we must pray for this that we will know the spirit of wisdom who enlightens our hearts with relationship with Christ. We will know our glorious power of him who saved us. Would you bow with me as I close? Lord Jesus, we thank you today for your word, for this ancient letter, for this prayer, really, that's on our behalf. And we ask that your Holy Spirit fill us with the knowledge of your Son, not just information, but knowledge of your Son, that we would know your immeasurable power, and you will remind us of our glorious hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Receive now today's benediction that we go now in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the name that is above all names, and may you know his immeasurable power for those of us.